Well, this, this being my uh, very last sermon of uh, my active ordained career, it was really very hard to determine uh, what to preach. Um, very, very hard. Uh, you know, I, you may not know this, but actually the two hardest uh, Sundays uh, or times to preach in the church here for me are actually Christmas and Easter. You'd think that's just such a familiar topic. It would be easy. But when you're really trying to d design something that's, that's speaking to people that don't frequently uh, engage Christianity and those that are mature and try to t touch all of that, it's really, really quite challenging. And this is kind of had that same sort of challenge. What do you say? Well, I had about five sermons going, and I kind of eventually just chose one here. Um, first, I want to say thank you for all those that participated last night in the fantastic uh, celebration of my retirement and, and ministry. It was just a real delight to, to, to do that. And it was so encouraging to, to experience such an outflow of love and support and affirmation. And it's particularly challenging because I'm, I'm in a very retrospective uh, kind of place in my life right now, given retirement uh, looming here. Um, and so, you know, thinking back on things, and one of the questions I think one would always ask if they're retiring from a long, a long vocation is, was it successful? Well, you know, that is a, that's a good question. Uh, how do you measure success in ministry? I mean, it's not like some other vocations that are pretty, pretty, you know, hard and fast. I mean, if you're building widgets, you know what you're doing, you know how many you're making, and you sell them, and you know the profit margin, and you can determine, you can you calculate all of that. Um, you know, whether you're building roads or building houses or growing watermelons or um, winning games, that you can calculate wins, wins and losses pretty easily. But there are other vocations where it's a little more uh, difficult. In some ways, medicine's like that. Like, you, know, you can, you know, the hard things about it, you can treat a illness and it clears up. And that, but there are other things that it's really a management of a quality of life for somebody. It's hard to say, are you successful in that or not successful in that? Um, uh, psychology, politics, and certainly the ministry are ones that it's very difficult to gauge uh, success. I mean, is it success in ministry? Is it, as they say, nickels and noses? Is that how you gauge it? Um, how, many, how much money comes into the church and how many people we plant in the pews and put on the membership rolls? Well, that's a calculation, but is it really um, honing in on the idea of, of, of this is successful? I guess you could have a whole church full of people that really aren't experiencing a transformed life, and that would not be success in my particular view. So it's really difficult to gauge that, I think, to look back on it. But as I thought about this and was developing this sermon, I was, I was thinking first of Jesus. Was he successful? Well, I think we would say he was successful because we're sitting here today 2,000 years later. So, you know, but was he successful at the time of his ministry? Well, it depends on how you gauge that. I mean, because if you think about those gospel stories, we see that he had crowds of people, but those crowds were very fickle. You know, he would just say one teaching about being the bread of life, and they're, and they're, going, they're going away. They don't follow him anymore. You know, so was that success? Because there were crowds, but they were very fickle crowds. He had active opposition by the authorities of his time. His family thought he was crazy at one point and tried to take him home by force. Um, some of the crowds tried to kill him. One of his 12 disciples, one of his closest, betrayed him to death. He was convicted and he was executed in the most painful uh, type of execution of the time, crucifixion. Only one of his disciples was anywhere nearby when he was dying and suffering on the cross. The rest were in hiding. Is that the mark of success? Well, I would say by American standards, that probably isn't. Let's look at the Apostle Paul. You know, we know very certainly how important his work and ministry has been to the church through the centuries. Highly important. But, you know, he actually, in, in one of his uh, letters, he was... He was um, he was sort of defending himself in, in, in the second letter to the Corinthian church. 
was defending himself because some were talking, you know, kind of trying to undo his ministry, and some uh, false, false teachers were, they were coming through uh, Corinth. And so he's, he, has, he says, I have to resort to, to, to giving you all this data about myself. Now here's, here's what the things that he lists that he, he had to go through. He says he had to go through greater, great labors, imprisonments, countless floggings, and often near death. Five times, he says, I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I received a stoning. Three times I was shipwrecked for a night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys in danger from rivers, dangers from bandits, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers and sisters, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, hungry and thirsty, often without food, cold and naked. And besides other things, I am under daily pressure because of my anxiety for all of the churches. Now, that makes my ministry look like a piece of cake, um, for sure, anybody's ministry in the world today. But, you know, is that success? Take this, too. He planted a lot of churches around uh, in Asia and Europe. Um, but we think of these, you know, church in Corinth, you know, with hundreds of thousands of people. It was, in each of these communities, there were a few dozen people. It was a very small groups in even large cities, 100,000, you had, you know, 30 people. And yet he was proclaiming that, that, that God was changing the world through his ministry and through the proclamation of the gospel. But if you take the snapshot of what's going on in his life at the time, you would say, he's out of his mind. This is not success to go through all of this incredible hardship and have just a, just a few hundred people in the whole world that are following the message that you're giving. How could that be any kind of success by the way we measure success in our time and in our culture. Well, as we well know, they were both highly successful. But again, if you take the snapshot of the time where they were ministering, you wouldn't say at that time. Here's, here's, here's an example of phenomenally successful ministry. And yet it was phenomenally successful, but not at the time of their ministry. So what we do see in Jesus, and we see in Paul and other Christian leaders, is that their ministry must be judged on the wide view. Again, if we look at Jesus, we look at Paul or anybody else, their success is based on something that's beyond that particular frame of their lifetime. And we see when we take that whole view of what was born from their ministry, that it was highly successful. Now, um, I'm at a point, again, in my life where I'm looking at that issue of success, but also looking at completion of things. Now, I've been here 16 years at St. Francis, which means if you, write, if you read something about the history of St. Francis, it will say that I was here from 2005 dash 2021. That's what it will say. Now, if you look at my 40 years of ministry, it would say 1981-2021. There's an even, even bigger calculation, and that is one that's not complete yet. The year of my birth, 1951, and the year of my death that's yet to be determined, with a dash in between. And that dash in any of these circumstances of our life are actually the sum total of our life. The dash is our life. The dates there are only start and end. What, the real life is that dash in between. And we see that, well, we take Jesus, for instance. He has um, birth at six... 6 B.C. dash 30 A.D. 
that dash didn't end in 30 AD. That dash continued to have influence. So that dash in our lives, that whatever investment we make in our life, whatever we make as a priority, whatever we put our energy and time and resources into are going to determine what our dash looks like in this life, but also what it's going to look like for future generations. That dash is a seed. It could be a good seed or it can be a bad seed, but it's a seed. We see that in Jesus and Paul. Again, we can't calculate it by the dash of their life at the time, that snapshot. But when we look at the full picture, with the work of the Spirit taking that seed and causing it to, to grow and to bloom and to flower and be fruitful and expand and multiply, and then we have something that actually changes the world, something we would actually call the kingdom of God. Um, I've thought, as I've been thinking about all of this, I was thinking of uh, my two grandfathers and uh, thinking about their lives and their, the dash that they, that they um, had in terms of what, what outcome they had for their life. Well, one of them um, was a very generous human being. I'll tell you a, a brief story about him. Um, I, uh, year, years ago, this is a little small town, North Florida town that my grandfather grew up in, and, uh, and he'd had a, um, a it was cotton gin at, one, at a particular point, and he had his office there, and then years and years later, uh, it became a, uh, a hardware store, and I was over there camping at the family farm one day, and and it was going into town, and I stopped by the hardware store to get something. I was talking to the older gentleman that was was uh, working there. And uh, I, he said, well, you're, you don't look familiar. Are you, where, you know, where are you from? What, what you doing over here? And I explained about the family farm, the black family farm. And, and he said, oh, my gosh. He said, that's your family. I said, yeah. He said, let me tell you a story about your grandfather. He said, this office right behind me here. He was in there one day. I came in. I was a young man in a very desperate uh, place in my life. I explained to your grandfather my predicament. And he was such a compassionate human being that he walked back into that office right there and he opened the safe and gave me, without any expectation of return, $10,000. And when I later on went through the ledgers of my grandfather, I kept seeing all these instances where he was giving to people, just giving and giving and giving and giving. This generous soul. And you know, there's, I, can, I can detect, I won't go into the, the specifics of this, but I can see that generosity and the seed, that, the seed that he sowed there has come down in some measure into our family. He sowed something that made a difference beyond his own life. On the other side of the family, my, my grandfather then was all of his adult life a raving alcoholic and died that way. Hardly knew the man. I can't see anything that was an investment in my life or the lives of any of my contemporaries. Well, they had, both had a dash. They both had a dash. But the outcome of that dash was radically different based on how they invested right now, right in the time of that window of opportunity that we have. From whatever those dates are, we have that dash. For some it's longer, for some it's shorter. We all have the dash. And so my hope is, as I look retrospectively, that the dashes that I have at St. Francis and during my 40-year career and hopefully in my life will plant a seed that will be actually successful. I may not even know of that success in this life. You may not either. You have a dash. And you have the opportunity to plant a seed that's actually going to bear fruit for the kingdom of God. And my parting words to you are these, invest in that. It's worth the investment. There's nothing more important. Now, recently I've been giving you some of my personal proverbs, and I want to leave you with one of my per another personal proverb I've not given you. 
when you look at your dash in your life, there's nothing you can do to make God love you any more than God already does. And there's nothing you can do that will make God love you any less than God already does. God loves you to the maximum. And there is our hope. And that's what makes our dash meaningful and transformational. It changes the world. That brings the kingdom of God. So with that, Michael E. Ellis, signing off.